Good morning, y'all. How are you doing today? Good to see you. I'm glad we brought back the uh, meet and greet handshake time. That was our first meet and greet handshake time since COVID. So I don't know what took us so long, but the van brought it back today. So that was cool. I know the introverts are mortified, but the rest of us are really happy. So... <laughs> Welcome to the story. Uh, my name is Eric, and I'm uh, the lead pastor here at the Story Church. Our mission is to inspire non-religious people to follow Jesus. Simple as that. And uh, we are living in a very exciting time. I want to say hello and welcome to all the folks joining us online. And of course, we have our Timber Grove campus as well. Timber Grove has uh, live preaching today with Pastor Kale bringing the message over there. But we have that campus in the Heights. If you're looking for something closer to home, live up that way. Um, also, uh, we have people joining us from all over the place. So just, I just want to welcome you all and acknowledge you as part of the story today. All right, uh, big times at the story right now. We are now... Gosh, after today, we have two more Sundays in this space, which is wild to think about. Absolutely crazy. It seems like yesterday that it was forever away, right? And now here we are. We have two more Sundays after today um, in this space on the 12th of November. We're going to be uh, opening up our new home at 3223 Westheimer Road in uh, the River Oaks uh, area of town, um, where the story began, really, from 2015 to 2021. That was the place we called home, that neighborhood. And, and now we've had uh, two awesome years, almost, in the, in the museum district. We've loved it, but we're going home on uh, November the 12th. Same worship times, just to uh, avoid any confusion there. We just left that the same, 8, 30, 9, 45, and 11. And remember, we're going to be in the gym over there um, for a while until the sanctuary is completed. So lots of great things going on there. Hope you listened to the announcements earlier because there was a couple big things coming up. Um, I won't repeat all of them. I just really want to get that family um, workshop on your minds, on your calendars. You got to let us know you're coming so we can uh, be sure to RSVP. Spots are filling up. So if you have a family or want to have a family of any kind, um, this uh, family workshop weekend with Jeremy Pryor will change your life. It'll change your family's trajectory. Talking generational shift, all right? So uh, November the 11th, that's the day before grand opening over in River Oaks, so it's going to be a huge weekend for the story, and I hope you all will get signed up. You can find out more at thestory.church, all right? So uh, what day are we moving over? 12th of what? All right, good. They're listening, people. All right. So uh, two more Sundays here. I'm just telling you, if you come back here on the 12th of November, it's just going to be you and the other forgetful ones, all right? So um, anyway, uh, that's going to be a, a great, great day for us. we got an exciting season ahead. All right, today is part six in a 26-part message series called Acts of the Apostles, how a handful of nobodies became a movement for everybody. Um, this is basically the story of, of how the church was born, how Christianity was born, and how it began to thrive even at its inception, So, even, and even despite a lot of persecution. Today's reading from Acts that we're going to get into in a minute is the story of the first wave of anti-Christian persecution. So um, we're going to see that in just a moment. You have study guides. You can pull those out um, that you were, hopefully you were given when you came in. If you missed that, they're hanging on the wall in the back if you would like to have a study guide to follow along. Those of you watching online, the study guide is usually linked in the comments section, so you can keep up in that regard. Today's uh, message is entirely focused around this very foundational and extremely controversial Christian claim. I know there's a lot of controversy around religion and a lot of controversy around Christianity in particular, and this claim that we're talking about today is part of the reason why. This claim is at the heart of why a lot of people become disenchanted with Christianity. A lot of people say they walk away from Christianity because of the claim that we're talking about today, and uh, it's found in the reading we're going to do in a minute. I'll just tease part of today's reading and give you a little snippet of it. This is the summation of this controversial claim we make as Christians. Acts 4 verse 12 puts it this way, salvation is found in no one else. Implied in this statement is that no one else can save you but Jesus. Jesus alone can save you. He is the way, not a way. That sort of thing is foundational to Christian understanding and Christian worldview, but it's also, it feels anyway, impolite. And you can be a lot of things in Houston, Texas and get away with it, but not many people in Houston will, will let you get away with being impolite and unpleasant. You know, they'll call you out for that. We should all be pleasant and nice and polite. And, and, and so this seems a little abrasive, doesn't it? It seems a little bit um, separatist, right? No one else can be saved but those who follow Jesus. Like, how do we reconcile this with the love of God, right? 
I mean, I mean a, another way of putting it, maybe a little bit more ab abrasively, like some of our less uh, restrained, uh, some of our less delicate Christian brothers uh, have put it this way over the years. Basically, we're saying, turn or burn, like this church sign, <laughs> turn or burn. And by the way, Happy New Year. <laughs> I love it. I, I just love that little touch, you know, uh, turn or burn in hell forever. Happy New Year. All right. So anyway, um, that's one way to put it. I mean, it's, again, indelicate, but at its heart, that's kind of what it feels like or what it means to say there's no other name by which we can be saved than that of Jesus Christ. He is the way and not just one of many ways. Turn to him or burn in hell. Is that what we're saying? When I was um, not a Christian, when I walked away from Christianity, this is the sort of rhetoric that I wanted to walk away from, right? Anybody else here agree with that? Like, have you ever been in that place where you're just like, I'm okay with some parts of Christianity. I'm okay with like the Good Samaritan. Can we just take the Good Samaritan part of Jesus and leave this part out? Like, like can we pick and can we choose? Um, because this stuff is just a little much. I don't want to be that guy who stands on the sidewalk and tells unbelieving non-Christians that they're going to burn in hell for not having the right religion. I don't want to be a part of that. That's who I was for you know, 13 years. It just seemed a little bit <clears throat> unnecessary, a little bit cruel, actually. And I remember thinking, whenever I heard Christians say things like this, I remember thinking, even if you do believe that to be true, that there's no other name under which we can be saved, only people following Jesus can be saved, even if that's what you believe, why would you want to broadcast it? Why would you want to lead with that? Who do you expect to attract with a message? Have you ever heard anyone say, I was in a really dark place once until some Christians I never met put something on their church sign telling me that I was going to burn in hell forever for not being like them. And that's when I decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Have you ever heard that testimony? I've yet to hear that testimony. Usually it's a little more relational than that. But, but my question when I was not a believer is why even broadcast this belief? Why not keep this for like, you know, like the Scientologists do. Keep it until you're all in, you know? It's like, keep the weird stuff until you're level 12 or whatever. It's like, let's just, why do we, why do we broadcast it? Um, and and it, it was lost on me. It just felt unnecessarily um, hateful. Unless, of course, Christians have some particular axe to grind or bone to pick, so unless they're provoked in some way by some hateful people that have come after them. Like, like maybe there's a justification here and there to say something like this out loud, like, uh, like this Christian group, this church uh, with another sign, um, put it this way. They said, whoever stole our AC units, keep one. It's hot where you're going. Turn or burn, right? So that's another way of saying it, and they've got a reason. They've got a reason for going there. I like these Christians a little better than just turn or burn, happy new year. You know, they're a little less trite. I get it, okay? So, and, and, yet, and yet the point remains, like, without that provocation, unless somebody steals your AC units, like, what right do Christians have to make such bold claims that draw such clear lines in the sand between insiders and outsiders, Christians and non-Christians, saved and condemned. And condemned. What, do we, what right do we have to make such a uh, claim? What gives us that right? Now, that's the sort of issue we're dealing with today. And uh, first off, I want to say, turn or burn is probably not the way we're going to say it at the story. Like, we're not going to be printing up T-shirts, the story church, turn or burn, or we're not going to be, you know, that's not going to be our mantra, all right? Um, even though I recognize it does have a nice ring to it. Uh, it rhymes, for example. It's easy to remember, you know, turn, burn, all that. And so much so that I've noticed lately secular groups using the same exact mantra for their own political purposes, like this um, billboard that I found from the Sierra Club where Governor Cuomo says, let's turn, not burn. But this is about something else, right? So, and we all know that when Governor Cuomo talks, it's probably true, right? <laughs> anyway, that's a political joke. So, the, <laughs> he's no longer governor, in case you're wondering. So, the, <laughs> The, the idea is the same here, like, like regardless of Christian, non-Christian, whatever, we all are drawn to these sort of pithy mantras. And the question is, what's beneath them? What's behind them to support them? Because the, while the, I don't love the wording, turn or burn, I think the principle beneath it is, is there's truth there that we should be willing to talk about. And that's what we're talking about today. But we have to be very careful as Christians when we decide to take up this, this topic and I think we have to be careful for two reasons. The first reason is because a lot of us are scared into submission. 
and scared into silence to the extent that we never say this stuff at all. Like, I'm not even sure we think it anymore because it's so impolite and off-putting. We would just rather conceive of our Christianity as being one of many equal paths. And everybody has their way, and we have our way, and whatever works for you is great, and whatever works for me is great, and let's just do our thing and see you in heaven, guys. And like, that's how we like to think of it. The scriptures don't give us that option. Jesus doesn't give us that choice. And so um, in a world that's often intolerant of views like this, we have to insist on professing and proclaiming key aspects of our Christian faith, even if there's a price to pay. The clip I'm about to show you is from a Senate subcommittee hearing from a few years back. A very uh, notable senator who you'll recognize is questioning a uh, nominee for some government board thing. I don't know. And, uh, and, and the, the nominee's Christian faith comes up in the line of questioning. The nominee's name is Russ Vaught. He's a, a Christian and doesn't have any real extreme or extraordinary Christian views. He's just posted things online that are basic Christian thoughts like, you know, this thing we're talking about today. There's no other name by which people can be saved than that of Jesus Christ because his name is, is the highest. It's the best. He, he is the one. But watch what happened whenever his Christian faith came in to the crosshairs in this line of questioning. Senator, I'm a Christian. I, I understand you are a Christian, but this country is made up of people who are not just. I understand that Christianity is the majority religion, but there are other people who have different religions in this country and around the world. In your judgment, do you think that people who are not Christians are going to be condemned? Thank you for probing on that question. As a Christian, I believe that all individuals are made in the image of God and are worthy of dignity and respect regardless of their religious beliefs. I believe that, that as a Christian, that's how I should treat all individuals. And do you think your statement that you put into that publication, they do not know God because they have rejected Jesus Christ the Son and they stand condemned, do you think that's respectful of other religions? Senator, I wrote a post based on being a Christian and attending a Christian school that has a statement of faith that speaks clearly with regard to the centrality of Jesus Christ and salvation. I would simply say, Mr. Chairman, that this nominee um, is really not someone who is what this country is supposed to be about. I will vote no. If you didn't hear the end there, he said this nominee is not someone who is about what this country is supposed to be about, so my, I will vote no, is what he said. And the argument he seems to be making is that Anyone who believes their religion is the right religion or the superior religion must be a bad person. And if uh, you have a religion where bad people believe it, then the religion itself must be bad. It's sort of an argument ad hominem, right? Like if bad people say certain things, then what they say must be bad, and, and only bad people would say those things anyway. So it's sort of a circular thing, but, but, but it's, it's the world's way of dismissing uncomfortable truth claims. Uh, whether it's Christianity in this case or other worldviews that have similar exclusive truth claims. It's, it's a really good reminder, especially for our young people who are in high school, maybe college age, or just out of college. Whenever you say things that are disagreeable according to this world, things that this world calls bad, it's not just your ideas they will deem bad. It will be you. You will be deemed bad because you espouse bad views in the eyes of the world. And that's because the world we're living in now has become so fixated on feelings that it conflates how something feels with how true it might be. And one of the hardest and most important lessons I've learned in adulthood so far is that the truth is feelings proof. The truth is not conditional based on how things feel to us. Now, when I wasn't a Christian, I, I conflated those two things all the time. My negative feelings about Christians and Christianity and the Bible in some cases didn't change the truth ultimately, the objective truth of reality. But when I was in that frame of mind, my feelings felt like my truth. And that's the experience of a lot of people today. And I say that really with no um, 
but I don't, I don't mean anything negative or bad about people that are in that frame of mind. I have mercy for people in that frame of mind because I've been there. I know what that's like, and I know that's how people are being sort of raised and indoctrinated today. And even now that I'm a Christian, I have to check myself sometimes. I'm like checking my feelings all the time. Y'all don't think there are days when I don't feel like paying attention to or submitting to or speaking the truth of God? You don't think there are days when my feelings come into conflict, conflict with God's truth? Of course there are those days for me, just like there are for anyone else. And the deeper we get in, in this walk with Jesus, the more we come to understand that when it comes down to a, a match between or, or a contest between the truth of God and the feelings of Eric, the truth better win. Or, or, or I'll find myself in dire straits um, soon enough, following my feelings around as though they are my truth. And so the ultimate question here shouldn't be, how do you feel about the fact that Jesus is the only way to salvation? All right? The ultimate question should be, is that true or not? Is it, what, feelings aside, is it true that Jesus is who he said he was, or is it not? That's the fundamental question. And so we as Christians, once we come to that conclusion, should not hesitate to be bold. Okay? Is there an eclipse happening again or something? What just happened in the room? All right. It's dark. Anyway. Anyway. All right. A little creepy. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to keep going. Okay. So, uh, so that's the first reason we should be careful in terms of this topic, to not be scared into silence. Now, the second reason we have to be careful is because if we just proceed to go out of this building and start shouting, turn or burn to the whole city, we're going to do more harm than good, right? So evangelism should be relational. It should involve listening. It should involve some compassion, some genuine concern for the people that we're trying to reach and not just these sort of blanket statements, turn or burn, like, like just as a strategy, we should always find the line where we speak the truth in love. So with that said, let's get to today's um, reading from Acts. This is Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. We're going to um, get through this today, uh, the first 12 verses of Acts 4. And what's just happened here, is, if you remember from the past couple weeks, is that Peter and John have just healed a man who was lame. He was unable to walk, and they healed him in Jesus' name, and, and everybody's talking about it, and some people are becoming Christians because of what they've witnessed. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. The priests... And the captain of the temple guard, so the priests were the religious sort of stakeholders, the captain of the temple guard that he represented the police force of the day, and the Sadducees, those were the ruling political elites, all right? These are the educated hoity-toity guys, all right? They all came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people. Why? Because they were the teachers. We're the, we do the teaching here. Who are you? Why are you teaching? That's why they were disturbed. And then it says they were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of the men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. That's from Psalm 118. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. No other name. There's some boldness for you. Spoken in love. Peter didn't just come out guns blazing, condemning these guys who had a hand in Jesus' death. In fact, Peter speaks to them with some mercy 
in his tenor. He's hoping to bring them into the fold, hoping they'll see the light. He's given them an opportunity by, by, by telling them the truth about Jesus. But what's really compelling to me about Peter here is not just what he said, but what he didn't say. What did Peter not say? Hey, to each his own. I found Jesus, but he's, he, he works for me. And you go find what works for you. You know, um, it's, we're all the same. All religions are the same. Everybody's going the same place. When we die, just be a good person. You know, he didn't try to soften the claim. He didn't try to, to blur the lines he was drawing. The line was very clear. In fact, the line Peter draws is refreshingly clear. Even if you don't agree with Peter, I think maybe in some part of your heart, you could find his clarity refreshing. Because who's clear anymore? No one. Only crazy people are clear in these days because they're the only ones that don't care what people think. The rest of us, we try to, we, we, we try to toe the middle ground. We try to keep ourselves from being canceled or whatever. And we try to make everybody happy. And we just end up, you know, speaking all kinds of hodgepodge, you know, uh, mishmash words and things that are unclear. But Peter was clear. Why? What gave them a license or the language to be so clear about Jesus? Well, Jesus did, obviously. They're not making this up about Jesus. Jesus has already said these things about himself. They're repeating what Jesus said about himself, like in the, the famous, or in some cases, if, regardless, depending where you are in, in your faith, infamous phrase that Jesus himself said about himself, John 14, 6, where he said, I am one of the ways and one of the, no way. That's not what he said. What'd he say? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's from Jesus's own mouth. And so again, the question isn't, well, how does that make you feel? The question is, is that true? And is Jesus worth listening to? That's the ultimate question posed by this uh, part of the book of Acts. Either Jesus is who he claimed he is, or he isn't. He's God in the flesh, or he's not. You can take him, or you can leave him. But for the love of God, don't try and dilute him, or diminish him, or domesticate him, or neuter him, or, or, or make him your buddy. Like, he's not. And there it is again, the darkness. Every time I say something important, it's like... <laughs> It's like the book of Exodus in here right now. It's like people online don't know, but it's weird in the room right now. So anyway, um, wow, it's, it's, it's really a binary choice that we get to make. And Christianity's proposition is pretty unique. If you don't like what Christianity or what Jesus uh, has to say, you're free to go find another God to serve. Like, like with our blessing, with Jesus' blessing, you're free to go find another God. That's not the point. Christianity is not here to shackle you or tie you down. And that's not the reason we're called to warn people about the consequences of going elsewhere to find someone or something to worship. The, the reason we are called to talk about this stuff is out of love for the lost, because we've been lost too. And we know the consequences long-term of worshiping or following anything or anyone who's less than Jesus. We will eventually find for ourselves, maybe the hard way, this truth that there is no one like him. There's no God like him. Try as you might, search far and wide and high and low. You will never find anyone to worship like Jesus. And, and by the way, everybody worships. It's not just religious people. You're, you're going to attach yourself to something or someone, some idea, some political party, and that will become your God. You'll attach yourself to some addiction, maybe. You'll attach yourself to sexual attraction. You'll attach yourself to the bottle. You'll attach yourself to your work. That's a biggie. Your, your own um, bottom line, your legacy, your family can be an idol. You'll attach yourself to all these other things and you will soon enough find out there is no God like Jesus. Eventually, every other God you bend the knee to will condemn you. Only Jesus will refuse to condemn you and he will take the condemnation on himself. Other gods, they, they will enslave you. Only Jesus will set you free. Other gods will give you exactly what you deserve, which sounds good until you realize it's not. Only Jesus will take what you deserve, so you might have what only he deserves for eternity. 
Lesser gods will destroy you. Only Jesus will redeem you and restore you. And ironically enough, it's, it's that thing about Jesus that he's uh, God Almighty, but he's also humble. Humble to the point that he didn't come to serve, but to be served. You've heard that, right? Humble to the point of laying down his life and dying for ordinary sinners. That seems to be what bothers people who are critical of Christianity and always has since the beginning of the church. I know it says that, you know, what bothered the Sadducees in this passage was the resurrection. They had a bone to pick with the resurrection. But everyone who criticized Christianity in the Bible seemed to have a problem with the notion of a savior who died, a a Messiah who was crucified. I mean, Paul brought this to the surface in his first letter to the Corinthians. He's like, look, I don't know what everybody else is preaching, but we preach Christ crucified. And and, and that is a stumbling block to the Jews. And that means in the context to the religious people, right? The religious right or whatever. And, And it is foolishness to the people of the world, to the Gentiles. Why? Because of the meaning of the words, Christ crucified. Christ means Messiah and Savior. Crucified, according to Scripture, Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, anybody that hangs, that dies, hanging on a tree, anybody that's crucified, is cursed, damned, condemned. And so what we preach is the one true God has been cursed for us. The one Messiah that we worship is condemned. Our Savior has been damned so that we could be free. And that's a lot for a lot of people to handle, the idea that we would accept a God because, because, because then we have to acknowledge our sin, acknowledge our role in him paying that price for us and be contrite about it and, and, and to repent of who we have been. It's not easy for us. And whenever we say as Christians that there's no other name by which we can be saved, we're not picturing some kind of a demagogue on some almighty throne with a scepter just waiting to strike people down to hell forever. That's not the image at all. We're talking about a king who died for his people willingly. King who lived like we should have and died like we should have just so that we might know him and be with him forever. For a lot of people, that's a stumbling block. That's foolishness. But for us, it's the truth. Now, I understand why that's a struggle. I understand why this whole thing is a struggle. Because we've, honestly, look, let's just get cut to the chase. We've all had loved ones who died. We're not sure where they stood with the Lord, right? And we don't want to be the kind of people that go to funerals that, you know, where somebody's not a Christian and we're like, well, I don't know. You know, I, I get it. There's some tension in the room. I just want to put a caveat here and say, nobody knows the heart of any person, right? Nobody knows their destiny but God. We're not judging anybody here. It's not about your church attendance record or anything like that. There's going to be plenty of people in heaven who never step foot in a church on a Sunday morning. I'm convinced about that, all right? Now, y'all should come back. (laughs) But this isn't your ticket to heaven, is what I'm saying. This isn't a game God's playing with us here. All right? The, the question is, who is Jesus? A lot of people get caught up on Jesus uh, not agreeing with them on issues that are important to them. They're, they're told that Jesus stands in this one place on marriage, you know, and, and the Bible stands in one place on marriage, but I really want to stand over here on marriage, and until Jesus comes and meets me here, I'm not going to give him the time of day because essentially what we're saying is, I have higher standards than Jesus. My morality is more finely attuned than Jesus is. Like the self-centeredness of it is striking, but it's where a lot of people are today. And you can take any other topic, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be that one, you know, topic. It can be any um, hot button issue. And a lot of people just want Jesus to agree with us. And until he does, we're not going to come near to him. And and, and that's really uh, our problem. In our modern day, this is our issue, self-righteousness and self-delusion. We treat Jesus like a politician running for office, like we want to find someone who agrees with us on the issues, and we'll vote for him and let him represent us, and he can thank us later, right? Jesus doesn't want to be your elected official for a term. He's not running for office. 
You can have him as your king forever or not, and that's fine, but, but it doesn't involve him coming to meet you in the issues. It involves you recognizing who he is. And if there's a gap between you and him, it's probably not him that needs to move. And this is something I've learned over time. All my politics shifted. I mean, I'm not card-carrying one way or the other, but I, I was deeply entrenched in my politics, and he shook me up and continues to shake me up today. The question isn't, how do I feel about Jesus' positions? The question is, who's Jesus? Is he God, or is he just some foolish stumbling block? The good news is, because there's no one like him, when you meet him, you'll find someone better than and unlike any other so-called savior or God or idol you've ever encountered. This Jesus will meet you in your anxiety. He will meet you in your self-doubt. He will meet you in your depression. He will meet you in your problems. He'll meet you in your addiction. And he won't meet you there heavy-handed, ready to take you out to the woodshed. He won't meet you there with punishment. He'll meet you there with an embrace. He'll meet you there with an invitation home. He'll meet you there with a meal, like we celebrate at the end of every service. He'll meet you there with water to wash you up. He'll meet you there with grace. But he will also meet you there with a reminder of your sin and how you're not who you should be. You haven't been who you should be. And that seems hateful in the world's eyes, but I'm telling you that's the most loving thing you'll ever hear. It's when you finally hear the message, you're a sinner. Anybody that tells you you're perfect and you don't need to change, they, it might seem like they love you, but they really hate your guts because that's the last thing we need to hear. No one is good. Not one of us. We're all flawed. We're all sinners. But in Jesus, there is grace. That's why he came as he said in Luke 19.10, to seek and save the lost. Only when you are lost will you ever need to be found. Only when you're sick will you ever go to the doctor. And Jesus came for us in our lost state. And of course, the irony there is everybody's lost. Those of us who convince ourselves we're not, we're like the man in the family that refuses to stop for directions, right? Just keep driving and driving and driving. Somebody tries to give you directions and you just double down. I don't need no directions. I'm not lost. And everybody knows you're lost. Even you know you're lost. You just aren't ready to admit it yet. Why? Pride. Pride is the engine of self-delusion that keeps us in our condemnation. Pride says, I'm not lost. I don't need a savior. I don't need to admit anything. I don't need to confess or repent. I'm okay. Everybody tells me I'm a good guy. I'm fine. No savior necessary. Thanks, Jesus. Just spend your time saving other people. I'm good. When we get in that frame of mind, we get like this guy, Dave. I'm going to tell you about Dave. One time a while back, somebody had this idea to graffiti a side of a wall in the name of Jesus. And the way that they did it was, as you might be able to read here, Jesus, it says, no name is higher. But if you look real close, you see that sometime after somebody made this profession of faith, Dave brought his ladder to the wall. And Dave climbed up real high here. And I'll, I'll point it out over here. This Right up here, Dave climbed his ladder and painted on that wall like a four-letter word, his name, Dave, right above the name of Jesus. No name is higher, really? Dave's this. Like, that's the point he's making. Friends, I've been Dave. It's not as fun as it sounds. It doesn't go as well as you might think. Friends, don't be like Dave. Don't try to keep your name above the name of Jesus. You're not him. Only he is the Savior, the Messiah, the one capable of saving us. Christian salvation is not a matter of waking up and feeling good about yourself. Christian salvation is a matter of waking up and realizing you're a sinner and yet you're saved by the amazing grace of God. If I could sum it up simply and succinctly, it would be this. Christian salvation is a free gift available to everyone who wants it. Through Christ alone, show me, show me another worldview that rivals this. The idea that everyone can be saved regardless of track record, politics, background, past, race, ethnicity, languages spoken, educational background, success in the workplace. None of it matters with Jesus. Just come home. Just come home. There is no one like him. 
That's why when Christians talk about things like hell and eternity and damnation, it's not a threat. It's not hate. It's, it's meant to be a loving warning. Understand, when you conceive of hell, when Christians conceive of hell, we don't think of this fiery cauldron of, of penitent, contrite souls saying, we're sorry, we're sorry. No, that's not it at all. Everyone in hell will be saying the same mantra, we were right. We were right, and we don't deserve to be here. By contrast, everyone in heaven will be saying the same thing in a way. Not the we were right part, but definitely the we don't deserve to be here part. We don't deserve to be here. In hell, they'll be saying, chanting angrily, we know better than Jesus. But in heaven, we'll all be saying, we know nothing but Jesus. Friends, no lesser God can save you. Try as you might. No lesser God, no other worldview. You can't save you. Your favorite person can't save you. Your church can't save you. Your preacher can't save you. Jose Altuve can't save you. <laughs> as much as we all love that little man. <laughs> he is my favorite five foot four inch Hispanic person. <laughs> and I'm married to Giovanna. So <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> but even he can't save you. No one can, no one but Jesus can. And so my prayer is that if you haven't come home to him yet, you will come home to him now. The invitation is open. It's got your name on it. There's a place at the table just for you, no matter what you've done with your life up until this point. He waits to welcome you home with an embrace. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we pray that we might hear this invitation and heed it. I pray that someone here in this room or maybe a bunch of someones who haven't come home or haven't been home in a while might heed the invitation and come home once and for all. Lord, we thank you for your patience and steadfastness with us and waiting for us to see the light and come home. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Thank you for the price that you paid to Serve as our ransom to set us free. Lord, help us to receive that gift with gratitude, grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.